The Lord be with you. I invite you to turn with me in your copy of Holy Scripture to the 25th chapter of Matthew's Gospel. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 25, we'll be reading verses 1 through 13 there this morning. Matthew chapter 25, beginning with verse 1. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like this. Ten bridesmaids took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. When the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them, but the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, all of them became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a shout, Look, here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those bridesmaids got up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise replied, No, it will not be enough for you and for us. You'd better go to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. I think that's how they said it. <laughs> and while they went to buy it, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went with him into the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later the other bridesmaids came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he replied, Truly I tell you, I do not know you. Keep awake, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? And now, oh God, as we hear a word from Holy Scripture, may we hear what you would have us to hear. Lord, that we may do what you call us to do. That we may be the people you call us to be. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, in 1980, a little before my time, but shortly before his untimely death, John Lennon released his final album called Double Fantasy with his wife Yoko Ono. Now, to be honest, I've never heard the album, at least not the entire album, and I don't know much about how it was taken, about its reception, particularly in the wake of Lennon's death. Uh, I haven't heard most of the songs on it, but there is one song I have heard, one song I've heard multiple times. In fact, if you've never heard the album but have seen the Richard Dreyfuss movie, Mr. Holland's Opus, you have heard this song, too. It was a song that John Lennon wrote to his then young son, Sean, a song called Beautiful Boy. And it's sort of what I imagine if John Lennon wrote a lullaby in 1980, this is what it would sound like. Now there's a lyric in that song, though, that I think rings with a great deal of truth. In it, John Lennon writes these words, Before you cross the street, take my hand. Life is what happens to you while you're busy making other plans. Life is what happens to you while you're busy making other plans. Now, in light of Jesus' parable this morning, I want to paraphrase Lennon, if I can, just a bit and say, life is what happens to you while you're busy waiting. You see, every time I've read this parable or heard somebody preach on it or talk about it, it usually goes something like this. There were ten bridesmaids or ten virgins. Five were wise and they were ready for when the bridegroom appeared because, well, they had plenty of oil. But the other five were dumb or foolish because they were not ready when the bridegroom appeared. Therefore, be ready. That's usually how it goes. Be ready for when Jesus comes again. You've got to pray the right prayer, do the right things, or else when Jesus comes back, you're going to be left out of the banquet. The end. Let's pray. Pass the plate and have the invitation. Right? That's usually how I hear that. But that's not what this parable is about. 
It's not about simply being ready for for some unpredictable end, about having your bags packed, your ducks in a row, your ticket bought, your paperwork in line, and your plans all laid out. No, no, that's not what it's about at all. This parable is about much more than that. So much more than that. You see, when you read it, all ten bridesmaids are actually prepared for the arrival of the bridegroom. All ten of them know He's coming. All ten of them have brought their lamps to light the way for the traditional procession to the bridegroom's house. That's why they had them. You brought the lamp because when the bridegroom came out, you would light the way to His house where there'd be a big party, right? They were all there ready for that. In fact, all of them at the shout, when they're told, here He comes, well, they all get up. They're all ready. They get up. They trim their lamps. They are ready for the bridegroom's appearance. The only difference, Jesus says, between these two sets of bridesmaids is that five brought enough oil for their lamps and five brought extra oil for their lamps. That's it. Five of them didn't score higher on the ACT. Five of them didn't make it through a master's level program and five didn't know. The only difference, Jesus says, some brought enough And some brought extra. So here's where we need to ask a question. A question I think that's so obvious that we we often fail to ask it. We overlook it when we read the parable. Why did these wise bridesmaids bring extra oil if the foolish ones didn't? I mean, did they have some inside information about the delayed arrival of the bridegroom? Were they all waiting and got a text before they left the house and said, Hey, hey, Greg's going to be like a few hours late. You might want to bring some more oil. No. Did they always carry extra oil for their lamps everywhere they went? Were they betting on things taking a while? I don't know about you, but just about every wedding I've been to never starts on time. The first one that ever did, I think, was ours. Because I was sort of like, we're going to start on time. And everyone that I do, like, I'm sorry, if, the, if y'all ain't in here, we start on time. But like most weddings, don't start on time. Maybe, maybe they were betting on it taking a while. But I mean, you read the parable. All ten bridesmaids are prepared for the bridegroom's arrival. They know the wedding customs. They would have been dressed for the wedding banquet. They would have been invited beforehand. They would have come with their lamps in hand because they know what's going on. They are ready. So they obviously know. They might have to be out in the dark for at least a little while. But why did these wise bridesmaids bring extra oil when the foolish ones didn't? Now, here's where I've heard some preachers say something to the effect of, well, those wise bridesmaids are prayed up. They represent those that are rapture ready. They're ready. They are the ones looking forward to the return of Jesus, prepared to meet him because they've accepted that Jesus is the Lord and Savior of their lives. And so they're waiting and ready. I suppose that's one way to read it. But all ten, remember, all ten are looking forward to the bridesmaid's arrival. All ten believe the bridegroom is coming. All ten are actually prepared for the arrival. The difference, the difference is that while all ten are prepared for his arrival, only five of them were prepared to wait. Only five of them were prepared to wait. They were prepared to endure the bridegroom's tardiness. To do no more, they were ready to do more than just watch the clock and hope they got everything right. Five of them were prepared to wait. Can I tell you something? I hate waiting. I absolutely hate to wait. Really, I hate to wait in line at a restaurant only to get to the counter and be given a little buzzer thing and being told, here, wait. I hate it. I hate to wait. I know that I'm not the only one because I've been to a restaurant where I've gotten the buzzer thing and finally gave it back and said, let's all get out of here. And I've left a good steak to go eat some quick scrambled eggs because I hate to wait. I hate waiting so much sometimes that I'll give up something better if I can get something quicker. I hate to wait for things in the mail. 
One of the worst things I think I've ever done for my own sanity is I signed up to be an Amazon Prime member. An Amazon Prime member gets free two-day shipping. And not only that, I get to track in those two days where my stuff is. And boy, when it says out for delivery, you better believe I'm looking through the blinds. Where's the UPS man? Where's the mailman? Where's my stuff? Because I hate to wait. And I know I'm not alone on that because Amazon has 63 million Prime subscribers. So I'm not by myself. I hate to wait at the airport. I hate to wait at the doctor's office. That may be the worst. I hate to wait at the dentist, at the mechanic shop. I hate to wait on the weekend. It's only Wednesday. I hate to wait on Christmas. Christmas takes forever until it gets here. Then it's gone. Then it's gone. I hate to wait on deadlines. I hate to wait on other folks who are getting ready while I'm already dressed with my shoes on and my keys in my hand. I'm not talking about Sally. I hate to wait so much that I'll just sometimes give up on whatever it is I'm waiting on and move on to the next thing because it's taking too long. But here's the thing. Do you know why I really don't like to wait? The biggest reason, if I'm honest with myself, why I hate to wait is because I know. I know deep down that while I'm waiting, there are more important things to do. That there are other tasks that lie before me, other things I'm supposed to do. And the truth is, I just don't care about those things as much. And that's pretty sad. I don't care as much about the stuff I have to do as I am about looking out the window waiting for the mailman to get here. I just don't care. If I'm honest, I'd rather track my Amazon package, stand in line or watch the clock, than to do the hard work of living life. In the meantime, five bridesmaids were wise, not because they were anticipating and the others weren't. Five were wise because they were ready and willing to wait. They were prepared for life in the meantime. They were not only looking forward to the bridegroom's arrival, they were prepared to wait, to have enough oil for their lamps for however long it would take for the bridegroom to arrive. There'd be plenty of light at the wedding banquet. The lamps aren't for the banquet. The lamps aren't for when they get there. There's plenty of light there. You don't need those things there. No need for oil or lamps at the banquet. They were for the time of waiting. Five were wise because they were ready and prepared to wait. You see, I'm convinced that so many Christians, particularly in our country because of our sort of theological history, I'm convinced that so many Christians have focused so much on what we call escapist eschatology, or, or, or on this notion that the end time is coming so soon that we don't have to worry about stuff for too much longer, and it'll just wipe everything away, and everything will be hunky-dory. We are like those five foolish bridesmaids. We believe we're prepared for the end, but the truth is we're just not prepared to wait. So in the words of that great theologian, at least he was the first one I ever heard say it, Bobby Burns. He said, many of us have become so heavenly minded that we're no earthly good. We are so enraptured by the thought of ideas like the rapture, the end of days, and so on, that we read hundreds of books, watch dozens of made-for-TV movies and Discovery Channel documentaries. We listen to countless sermons. Give our money to organizations that promise a hastening of the second coming of Christ as if they have some kind of inside information. And we buy into all kinds of garbage about interpreting the events and signs of a 24-hour news cycle. We do that so much that we're almost giddy about the end. We hate waiting, don't we? We hate waiting that much. I do. I'm convinced that our obsession with the end of days is what has led us to a great deal of unease in our world. That we're so focused on preparing for some unseen end, some great finality, that we spend most of our time distracted by our ideas of the future, or maybe even by our ideas about heaven. That we miss the calling of God. 
the opportunities that Christ has placed before us here and now while we wait. In the meantime, we allow our singular focus on the future to create a lot of anxiety today. What's it going to be like? Do I have all my ducks in a row? Is it all there? Have I done the right things? Is it the way it's going to be? Is it how I want it to be? Is it the thing? Is what's going to happen what I want to happen? And we miss what God has called us to do right here and right now. Because when the bridegroom comes, it doesn't come on our timetable. When we're sure we've had enough oil in the lamp to make it to his arrival. When he doesn't show up when and where we expect, we can lose hope. And that's not just in the grand sort of end times way of thinking. When God doesn't show up when and where we expect, when we've prayed and asked God to show up here and now, and he doesn't, or there and then, and God doesn't, at least to us, we can lose hope. That, my friends, I think is why the five bridesmaids who brought extra oil are wise. Not because they were just prepared for the bridegroom's arrival, but because they were prepared to wait for his arrival. They were prepared for the meantime. For many of us, faith has become this this thing that we've gotten caught up in this contrived notion about getting caught up in some kind of rapture, of escaping the world when the end comes. But Jesus calls us to a greater faith than that. A faith that not only looks forward to the future, but a faith that is most assuredly grounded in the present and the here and now. The faith to which we are called is not only about the sweet by and by, but it's about doing part of God's will, about doing what Christ prayed, to bring God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. It is as much about being ready for Christ's return as it is about being ready to wait for it. So if in the words of John Lennon, life is what happens to you while you're busy making other plans, if you know the bridegroom is coming, if this faith to which we are called is as much about the present as it is about the future, if it is as much about waiting as it is about what's coming, What are you going to do in the meantime? What is Christ calling you to do while we wait? Let's pray together. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on us, Lord. Forgive us. Forgive us, God, when we are so caught up, so caught up in thinking about the arrival, about the future, that we ignore the the calling you place before us here and now. Give us eyes to see, Lord, what you call us to each day, ears to hear your voice as you call us, hands and feet, God, to go and to do what you call us to here and now. Lord, in this time, help us to hear your voice. Help us, God, to see where it is you're calling us. And give us the strength, Lord, to step out and go and do what you call us to do. Be with us now, Holy Spirit. We pray in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen.